Now, some of the people here are guests and don't know anything about pandas. So to explain this amazing illness and the woman who discovered pandas, Dr. Susan Sweeto will now be speaking. She is the Chief of Pediatric and Developmental Neuroscience at the NIMH and a dear friend and my hero. So. No, thank you very much. That's that's truly an honor, but it's it, it's just too embarrassing. I was born and raised in Iowa. We don't do that there. So I I am going to give an introductory lecture. I apologize to those of you who've already seen this on the internet. It um, it doesn't change that much, unfortunately. But I have I share all of the excitement we've already heard this morning that that um, Dr. Mike Cooperstock, who you're going to hear later has called 2014 the year of pandas. I would like to just change that slightly to 2014 is the year that we cure and eradicate pans and pandas. <laughs> the context of this is, is incredibly ironic and it makes me very sad every time I show this slide because I started it at the National Institute of Mental Health in 1986 as a pediatrician, the only pediatrician they've actually ever had on staff there, everybody else is psychiatrists and, and know the brain much better. But when we would go and give talks, my boss, Judy Rappaport, asked us to emphasize the fact that this wasn't the parents' fault. There had been a construct developed in the 1950s, much as Bruno Badelheim had blamed autism on a refrigerator mother, obsessive compulsive disorder was blamed on the mom's uh, punitive toilet training practices and harsh parenting. And we heard just now from the survey, uh, that wonderful data that you all gathered for us, the fact that parents are still being blamed for their child's illness or dismissed as having it be a significant factor. So we're going to go all the way back to the 80s when we finally got it that obsessive compulsive disorder was the ultimate brain disorder. There's a very well established uh, network in which there is dysfunction at multiple levels. And in adult patients who have uh, significant depression and anxiety, the main dysfunction lies within the orbital frontal cortex. Within children who have a triad of symptoms, that's obsessive compulsive disorder, tics, and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or ADHD, that triad lies within the basal ganglia. And here it's called the striatum, because it's a striatum in rats and basal ganglia in humans, and the uh, circuitry work was done in animals, but it was actually proven in people. In this circuit, if you go through the direct pathway, you get one set of symptoms. The indirect pathway, you get the other set of symptoms. And the antibodies that are, appear to be causing symptoms in pandas actually interact right smack dab at the caudate putamen and internal segment of the globus pallidus. And therefore, the symptoms can be explained by that and as we already heard, they can be very, very different. If your child has primarily tics, it's probably more uh, affect affected in the putamen. If it's primarily OCD, it's the caudate. And the ADHD, that impulsivity, concentration difficulties, are coming from the internal segment of the globus pallidus. So again, it, this is neuroscience. It's, it's hard, but it's not impossible, particularly when you take the fact that this has been known since the early 1800s. Sir Thomas Sydenham, after whose Sydenham Korea is named, actually had described uh, difficulties that sounded very much like obsessive compulsive symptoms. And Sir William Osler, who named most of the things in the medical community, had described perseverativeness of behavior. And actually, uh, Kyle Williams has just gone back to his essay on Korea and Korea form affectations and pulled out just beautiful examples of children hiding their clothes or being unable to put on socks and shoes because of the texture issues. So in 1994, we published the first cases of post-infectious obsessive compulsive disorder in ticks and called it at the time PITANS, Pediatric Infection Triggered Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Syndrome. And we actually just found cases that happened after varicella, which is chickenpox, influenza, and after strep. We focused on the strep because this model in which the basal ganglia are primarily affected 
is exactly the same as what happens in Sydenham, Korea. There were pathological reports of destruction of the caudate nucleus in patients who uh, died of the rheumatic heart disease, but also had Sydenham, Korea. So we focused on those post-streptococcal cases because it was a nice, clean, easy model, we thought. <laughs> and it was a recognized illness. It's now been described as sort of the ultimate example of post-infectious autoimmune encephalopathy, and that is really important because just in the past probably month, I have had a, a sort of paradigm shift in the way I've been thinking about things, and I'm gonna share it with you now, and we're gonna write it up uh, together for the September issue of the Silver Journal. And that is that PANS is this giant circle of a whole bunch of things that can give you an acute onset of symptomatology. And we're gonna talk about how you just diagnose that. But that group doesn't have anything to do with etiology. It was very, very specific that it just helped clinicians identify the fact the kids are not supposed to be perfectly healthy one day and then completely tormented and very psychiatrically ill the next. That's just not the way it goes. With regular OCD or regular tick disorders, you might get an eye blink tick and then a few weeks later you might have a shoulder shrug and make some noises and things are sort of gradually increasing or with obsessive compulsive disorder, a few worries that then gradually increase in severity over the period of days, weeks, or more likely months. In PANS, it starts overnight, dramatically, and frankly, if you're in this room and you can't remember the day that your child's symptoms started, then they probably don't have PANS, and we should talk about what the other things sh that you should be worrying about are. You're not gonna find it um, maybe on the best blogs, but on most blogs you won't find that. And what worries me now is the parents who are trying to hold on to a PANS, PANDAS diagnosis for their child, when in actuality it's something different and something that should be treated with a different uh, set of approaches. But let's assume that you did have a very abrupt onset of your child's symptoms and that that is what characterizes this. That group of PANS, as I said, we don't know what causes all of those cases. We know that for a small group, it's related to strep, and those are what we call PANDAS. And if you imagine th two giant circles and a little circle connecting the two, that's where PANDAS lies. One giant circle is PANS, Pediatric Acute Neuropsychiatric Syndrome. The other giant circle is autoimmune encephalitis. And autoimmune encephalitis includes a very large uh, number of disorders, one of which is PANDAS, is a post-streptococcal onset of OCD, ticks, and the rest of the symptoms. So by thinking about it that way, I'm hoping that we really can make 2014 the year in which the controversy surrounding PANDAS disappears and we can get back to what the purpose of it was to begin with, that was providing meaningful treatment and most importantly, learning more about how these mental illnesses evolve to treat them more effectively. So PANDAS, I highlighted associated with and having just served on the DSM-5 committee that wrote the new criteria for autism, one of our uh, sub subgroups there was associated with known medical or genetic condition or environmental trigger. And we struggled over the word associated with for a year <laughs> because we wanted to say related to, we wanted to say caused by, how much could you say? And the conclusion was you could only say associated with. And I went, duh, we did that back in 1995. Associated with was only supposed to mean that we were making this observation, assuming causality in order to test the hypothesis, but even if the strep had not caused those symptoms, it was enough that you recognized it. Unfortunately, that associated with strep infections has really been the source of most of the controversy surrounding PANDAS, or at least the putative controversy. Let me just share a little bit about how the group was discovered, and it was just a discovery. It, um, it came about because, as I told you, I was a pediatrician. My dearest friend and a really talented child psychiatrist, Henrietta Leonard, did all of the thinking work, and the two of us worked up all of the children with OCD. And she was trying to teach me psychiatry, so she would do unusually long and involved histories. And we came out of this room one day and we went, that was just really different. The little girl was 12, and she swore that her OCD had started 
when she got home from the pediatrician's office because she had picked up a wrapped hypodermic syringe lying in the parking lot and thrown it into the trash can. Now you'd think she might have thought she got some infectious that could be spread by a needle. No, she thought she got rabies from this wrapped syringe and had just horrific rabies obsessive compulsive symptomatology. Very abrupt onset, she had had an episodic course before she got to the NIH and it had settled into that kind of chronic, treat, somewhat treatment refractory illness. When we went back after having made the connection to Sydenham's Korea and looked, why do you think she was at her pediatrician's office? Her third strep infection within a month and a half, and more importantly, her brother was also positive and had probably infected her in that time. So when we went and looked at the whole cohort of 125 children and then began recruiting children with acute onset obsessive compulsive disorder, we discovered the pandas phenomenon, which is this unusually abrupt onset, a relapsing and remitting, sort of sawtoothed course where the child will be very, very bad, maybe plateau and then eventually get better and then get worse again. Not like ticks and Tourette's where it waxes and wanes if they're having a stressful day, it's worse if it's an easy day, things are better. No, this is off and on, or maybe the baseline piles up so they never completely go symptom free. Boys outnumber girls as they did in this room by about three to one, and comorbid ticks and OCD were present in about two thirds of the kids. Well, that led us to make these criteria and we described them as working research criteria but unfortunately, when we wrote them up in the American Journal of Psychiatry, the little call-out box had a mistake. And on that number three, it just said episodic course, relapsing, remitting, not waxing and waning. The text actually said, uh, pandas is characterized by an unusually abrupt and dramatic symptom onset and exacerbations that are similarly uh, dramatic in their, um, their onset. And unfortunately, Roger Curlin chose to use just the box. So in his papers, he always cites as published in the 1998 AJP criteria. Despite the fact that in 2004, he, um, he and Ed Kaplan debated Judy Rappaport, Henry and I in the journal Pediatrics about what PANDAS was supposed to be, and he should have figured it out after that. But he didn't, and I think that that has also contributed to this controversy because it's very easy to look in the wrong place. Well, let's just take a high road, take the positive, and teach you something that's actually going to be useful, and that is how can we think about this disease in a way that helps us to really begin to understand the disease mechanisms, but also a much more effective way to treat the children. And that is to borrow the model of Sydenham Korea, in which certain strains of group A strep in genetically susceptible children give rise to a misdirected autoimmune response. And Dr. Jenny Frankovic and I will probably fight for the rest of our lives about whether this is truly autoimmune or whether it's misdirected. I don't think it matters, and we both understand that quite well. So no worries that we're actually fighting with each other. <laughs> but the reason I think it's important to think of this as misdirected is that it implies if it's a classic pandas case, like a classic Sydenham Korea, that a single uh, very effective method of immunomodulation then with adequate prophylaxis should protect that child. Unfortunately, that's probably not the majority of children. More of them are going to have some generalization of the response and will have flares with things other than strep. But in theory, that should work, and I do have a number of my patients in whom they just had a single episode, we were able to treat it effectively, maintain them on prophylaxis, and they went on to never have any subsequent problems. Well, as I told you, the connection to strep is probably the most controversial. So we've actually looked at all of the literature and found five lines of evidence that support an etiologic relationship of strep to pandas. And I'm going to go through most of these with you today just to help you understand why we think that strep is involved. The first one is clinical observations in epidemiologic studies. This is actually the only evidence that we have that strep causes Sydenham Korea and acute rheumatic fever. There haven't been any animal models developed, and the laboratory data is very sparse and, and primitive because it was all done in the 1950s. We took the approach that if the presence of ticks and behavior problems increased during months when strep was present, that that would be an indication that the two might be associated with each other. And indeed, we found out 
in an elementary school uh, in Virginia that that was true. And what I want you to notice is actually how common these things are. The uh, lavender lines are ticks, and the maroon lines are problem behaviors, kids getting up out of their seats without asking for permission or interrupting the teacher, an ADHD-like impulsive behavior. And I did a lot of these classroom observations, and I can tell you that the most important determinant of how a classroom uh, behaves is how the teacher behaves. Because I would go from one classroom to a next, you know, do all the sixth grade classrooms in one morning, and in some, I was just very agitated at the end, and in others, everything was very cool. So it would have been fun to report that, but what we did was just average them out. And ticks were present in about 10% of children. So these, if the child has only ticks and they're relatively mild, it's something that we as parents just need to look past and or ask the, ch the kids themselves, is this something that's causing you embarrassment or problems? The problem behaviors were in that same range in the winter months and during the spring when the tick, uh, when the strep disappeared from the school, they would decreased. We didn't actually have an opportunity to find out a direct connection between strep, but my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Tanya Murphy, the University of Florida did do this in a school in Putnam County, Florida, a very poor county where a lot of migrant workers are there. So the public health department had a monthly surveillance throat culture program in place and they did the same kind of observations while the kids waited in line for their throat culture. They did the Romberg stance and at, looked for choreiform movements and found a one-to-one -one correlation between the children who then had a positive throat culture versus those who just had and had the movements versus those whose cultures were negative. And that really uh, raises some issues for our infectious disease colleagues like Dr. Cooperstock in that strep is typically uh, observed in the throat without symptoms as a carrier state. But a true carrier is a child who has made no immune response. So in theory, they can't have an autoimmune reaction as part of that if it's, they're just carrying the strep in their throat. The second thing is treatment of strep reduces the OCD ticks and exacerbations. This is a wonderful study. If your pediatrician doesn't know about this one, share it with them. This group has absolutely nothing to do with anybody in the PANDAS specialty world. And they demonstrated in their large pediatric practice of about 3,000 patients, 12 children over a three-year period. So in that practice, this was a rare phenomenon, but rare does not equal non-existent. It just means they may not have had experience with it. Seven boys and five girls, 100% were found to have obsessive compulsive symptoms, most of them uh, contamination fears and emotional ability, but their presenting symptom was actually that second line, urinary frequency or enuresis. They had had urinary uh, tract infection works up, workups with negative urine cultures and the doctors were clever enough to do a throat culture. That was positive. And when they treated them with antibiotics, eight of the 12 had a complete remission of their symptoms. So it leads me to believe that if we can get this very early, get the awareness up to the point where teachers and school nurses and parents understand when their child's behavior deteriorates, go in and get a throat culture. Or certainly if they're having urinary frequency, in addition to culturing the urine, culture the throat, we might be able to make a difference. In rheumatic carditis, the thing that was the most definitive evidence was the fact that if you prevent future strep infections with antibiotic prophylaxis, you can prevent further heart damage. So we used that same method and thought that if the OCD and ticks were sequelae to a strep infection, then if you prevent the strep, you should be able to reduce the exacerbations of OCD and ticks. This was a double-blind parallel study of azithromycin versus penicillin, and we used two antibiotics because we actually expected the penicillin to fail. It had failed in our first trial when we compared it against placebo, and we had 14 of the 35 infections occurred during the penicillin phase. It was probably because they were all taking liquid penicillin. And first of all, you can't tell if you gave the morning dose by looking at the, the bottle. Is it a little bit down or not? And secondly, the penicillin tastes so tat nasty that the kids just wouldn't take it. So I think that we had a lot of problems with adherence, and that was our own fault. So for this study, we made sure that all of the kids could swallow pills. We sent them home with blister packs, 
And again, if your children are on antibiotics, hopefully they're on the least, uh, the most narrow spectrum, like a penicillin, it's very, very important that that dose be given every 12 hours if it's PenVK, because the half-life is such that if you miss one dose, you're not protected for the next five doses or the next five half-lives. Miss Monday morning's dose because the house is chaotic, that child is not protected again till Thursday. So get those little pill minder things, keep it someplace that nobody can forget, and check that the child gets it before breakfast in the morning and then um, it's about 12 hours later in the evening. Sorry, I mix all kinds of clinical stuff in with science, but that's kind of who I am. So in this study, we had 22 children. We stopped it because we had already proven our hypothesis, and that was we were able to completely eradicate strep infections in this group of children, and we had a dramatic decrease in the number of exacerbations, as shown in this slide. On the left side of the red line, for one, two, three, four, five children with penicillin, and five children with azithromycin. On the left side of the red line is the year prior to study entry, how many months they had symptoms. On the right side of the line is the year that they were in the study taking antibiotics. And you can see nicely that we were able to decrease the months during which they had symptoms. For most, but not all of the children, I think that that second child in the azithromycin group is a good reminder that if you're not getting this at the point where you're having a nice return to baseline, and even a year of antibiotics may not get the child completely symptom free. The final pieces of evidence were from work done by Dr. Madeline Cunningham and more recently by a group at Columbia and a group in Israel using antibodies to document uh, not only what was happening in our children, but also in two animal models. Oh, and I decided not to show you that now. I'm going to talk about it more in a minute. But suffice it to say that the, the data now are sufficient to meet not only Koch's postulates for an infectious diseases trigger, but also Wetepsky's for autoimmune in, um, infections. Susceptible host. This question is probably asked of me more often than anything. I just want to remind you of a study that we did. Lorraine Lugy is the first author of this paper. It was published in the early 2000s, documenting that children with pandas are in families where OCD and ticks are common. 20% of first degree relatives of a child with, with pandas, who we would call the proband, 20% of their first degree relatives, siblings and parents, will have OCD and or ticks. It's a very, very inheritable disorder, and the Obsessive Compulsive Disorder Genetics Consortium has actually begun to find some genes for OCD. It's not something you're going to pick up with genetic testing. Comparably, they had an increased rate of rheumatic fever in the grandparents' generation, and among the parents, increased rates of autoimmune disorders. So those are the two genetic vulnerabilities. And maybe we can bring it up during the panel discussion, but I'm very anxious about parents spending money on genetic testing because there currently isn't a genetic test that can tell you your child is going to have pandas or not. It's done just as easily with a good family history, and you don't have to spend your out-of-pocket money on genetic tests, uh, including the um, methylfolate uh, reductase transporter, the MH, whatever that thing is. Thank you. <laughs> We actually did that study in our group of kids with autism and found out that the children who had low cerebral folate, which you can only find by doing a spinal tap, those children were not the ones who had the folate receptor antibodies and that the genetic defect actually had absolutely no relationship to the folate concentrations. So it's interesting, but uh, 23andMe will give you the information much cheaper and they aren't allowed to do it either because the uh, FDA shut them down for that. So genetic testing, not helpful. Family history, incredibly helpful. And I think Dr. Frankovic will talk more about that. So the molecular mimicry and the misdirected immune response giving the clinical manifestations. 
One of the best ways to think about pandas is that it's a form fruist of Sydenham Korea. And in medicine, a form fruist is an, a not fully developed form, which is probably not the right thing. If you hear stories about somebody being uh, incapacitated by their obsessive compulsive symptoms or their severe tics for years at a time, that's not a form fruist of anything. But it is true that in our early studies, the children who had full-blown Sydenham chorea had developed obsessive compulsive symptoms two to four weeks before the chorea began. So whatever the threshold is that gives rise to the neuropsychiatric symptoms is less than it is to give rise to the full-blown chorea. It causes disorders of executive function. Here I show you that the child has difficulty with response inhibition during a task that requires them to execute in a different pattern than expected. Rep response selection uh, is shown in that hash mark bar. The two that are abnormal in pandas and Sydenham's chorea is when you say two, three, four, one instead of one, two, three, four on a button press task. And you notice the pattern is strikingly different than what you would see in a garden variety child with Tourette's or ADHD. The antineuronal antibodies have just been a wonderful source of editorials about how this doesn't exist because Harvey Singer fails to find the antibodies in his group of patients. It's extremely frustrating because Dr. Singer does the antibody studies on the patients identified by Roger Curlin. So they didn't actually have pandas. And I just shown you in the slide before that kids with regular Tourette's do not have the pattern that you would expect in pandas. Well, the good news is that Madeline Cunningham, bless her heart, is just a very persistent and wonderful, lovely Southern gentlewoman. I think some of you met her a couple of years ago out here. And she was able to get Harvey Singer to agree that the two of them would do the assays on, on paired samples. And the results came out just as you would expect. And it's in uh, press. It's actually under review in the Journal of Immunology, Clinical Immunology. I think it'll be published by the fall. And that paper is probably the one that allows us to very legitimately claim 2014 is the year the controversy disappears. So you will know more than your doctors until that comes out in press. But in the meantime, they have no excuse for ignoring a very lovely body of evidence. Nature Medicine is one of the top journals in our, not just our field, in all of medicine. And the fact that Madeline's paper was published there, showing that CSF from patients with Sydenham chorea and the patients with pandas both had reactivity against the basal ganglia that was not seen in the psychiatric controls with OCD or tics is a very lovely and definitive piece. So if you can't see the reference, it's Curvin et al., 2003, Nature Medicine. And as soon as we fix the NIH website again, uh, it will be back in our, in our um, cadre of papers that we have posted there. And I say fix it because they updated it and they lost our PANS PANDAS page. I don't know how. Here shows that the anti-lysogangliocide antibodies decrease in convalescence. That's important evidence that they actually play a role in the etiology of the illness, and that they actually induce CAM kinase 2 activity in a cell model. And this is important because it means that the antibodies are signaling the cell, they have bioactivity, and that's the fourth criterion required for showing that a disorder is a form of autoimmune encephalitis. Dr. Cunningham's work has focused on the dopamine receptors. She's demonstrated that dopamine T D2 antibodies are present actually in higher concentrations in pandas than in Sydenham, Korea. There are actually four receptors for dopamine, and the drugs that are typically given uh, to our kids it will address one of those. There isn't actually a really good drug that's specific against dopamine D2, so that may, may be a target for future treatment developments. And then finally, I mentioned the animal models. What they were able to do was to induce pandas in a group of mice by giving them serum from our patients and then actually transfer the serum from those mice into a second group of mice and produce the symptomatology. And then the Israel group actually did the experiment in rats. And they did it by inoculating them with strep, producing a pandas-like picture, and then documenting that olanzapine and other drugs were helpful in decreasing symptoms, and also that when they sacrificed the animals and looked at the brain, that the staining was exactly where they thought it should be. So we go back 
now 15 years, to the uh, immunomodulatory treatment trial that we did at the NIH. And this was a randomized, completely controlled by the pharmacy randomization. Another very important point to note, because uh, Curlin and Singer and others have criticized us for not adequately blinding the study, which is true. Children received either an infusion of IVIG and sham IVIG or an infusion of plasmapheresis. You couldn't blind the plasmapheresis condition. We actually had written the protocol originally for a forearm study to do IVIG, sham IVIG, plasmapheresis, and sham apheresis, and calculated that it would take us the rest of our lives to get that study done. So we did this one. I can tell you that we actually followed it up with a plasmapheresis versus sham apheresis trial, where children literally, literally had a central line put in and were then hooked up to the plasmapheresis machine, but it wasn't actually removing the, the plasma. They just went back. I did four children, and I stopped the study because it was just completely unethical to ask a little five-year-old to go through this for nothing. So that study is not going to happen, but there's a really important negative study, Nicholson, N-I-C-O-L-S-O-N, and Rappaport, R-A-P-O-P-O-R-T, is Judy's name, it's spelled a little different than expected. Nicholson and Rappaport actually did plasmapheresis on garden variety children with obsessive, sorry, children with garden variety OCD, non-PANDAS OCD, and it had absolutely no effect. After I show you, the res, show you these results, we had a 65% reduction in symptom severity in our plasmapheresis treated group at one month, which is just, it was actually mind-boggling. We watched many of the children get better in front of us in the hospital. So we thought, as we treated these regular OCD, wouldn't it be great if this was just a treatment for obsessive compulsive disorder? And to be perfectly honest, I thought it might be. Um, I'm going to show you his uh, CAT scan in a second. But there was a boy who had very extensive symmetry concerns, and he did isometric exercises all day long. And so when he got hooked up to the IVs, my research assistant and I literally each had an arm to hold it still while he went through this. And that was two hours every other day of very intensive exposure with response prevention. <laughs> and I thought, maybe we just did intensive behavior therapy. But the five children with regular OCD look exactly like the placebo group in this trial. They had zero benefit. So when people say it's just a nonspecific kind of placebo effect, you can point them to that Nicholson paper as evidence, or to this paper, Perlmutter, P-E-R-L-M-U-T-T-E-R, -E -E in The Lancet in 1999. And what it shows is that IVIG is effective, not for all children. You can see some didn't actually move much, and it's not as effective as plasmapheresis. This is the boy with the exercising rituals. And he was unusual in that there was actually a visible enlargement of the head of his caudate. As a group, the children had signs of inflammation in the caudate, putamen, and globus pallidus. In this child, he actually had a 20% increase in, this, in the head of the caudate compared with age sex matched controls. And after successful treatment with plasmapheresis, it had normalized. I can't show you visually what it looks like to sort of cure the children. But I can show you in a patient with Sydenham chorea. And as I've told you, I believe that the psychiatric symptoms are every bit as severe as these motor symptoms. This, whoops, this girl came to us from uh, central Los Angeles. And she had moderately severe Sydenham chorea. And what you see is that the research assistant had to lift her up out of the chair. She has a lot of truncal hypotonia and a lot of difficulty. And every time she goes to take a step, a voluntary movement, it sets off a whole cascade of involuntary movements. And she looks like a dancing puppet. If it was a little bigger, she would talk, you would call it St. Vitus's dance. When she gets close, you can see that when she takes a step, even her toes are wiggling back and forth. Well, here she is two weeks later. We had spent her whole time that she was getting plasmapheresis working with our rehab medicine department to try and get her uh, belts and wheelchair and stuff to take home. And she really didn't need it. She has a little tiny bit left in her hand, but she can walk, she could talk. This was before she left the hospital, at the end of two weeks. 
at the end of two weeks, and she had been sick for three months before she came to us. So as I told you, I want to help the world start thinking about this as I now am, as PANDAS is post-streptococcal autoimmune encephalitis. It meets the five criteria laid out. It has an acute onset. It does follow group A strep. We've demonstrated evidence of cross-reactive antibodies against the neuronal cells of the basal ganglia. Those antibodies have uh, cell signaling capabilities. They have bioactivity. There's improvement with immunomodulatory therapies, and there was no effect of plasma exchange on regular OCD. You can prevent future episodes by adequate anti-strep antibiotics prophylaxis. Oh, and the animal models exist. So what does it mean for all of us? It really means that history is key. To have a child with PANDAS, all capitals, you have to have acute onset and a temporal relationship between the symptom exacerbations and strep. Otherwise, you just have a child with PANDAS, like my absolutely perfect grandson. He's the big brother now. I have two grandchildren. Oops. Yay. So what about the kids who don't have strep? That's probably many of you in this room, and those kids have PANS. So what do we know about them? Well, we know we have now models for them, and I believe that we, uh, through the PANS PANDAS Research Consortium, are making wonderful progress on determining what should be done in that initial diagnostic evaluation. Acute, 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 think foudroyant. Foudroyant is from the French for lightning-like, and the kids are literally struck down with this illness. Onset of obsessive compulsive disorder or an eating disorder, which was not always the presenting symptom, but a significant problem for at least one in five children with PANS. It has, they have to have OCD or tics. I real, excuse me, OCD or eating disorder. I realize we're gonna miss some kids who have predominantly tic disorders, but we'll pick those up after we can kind of end this controversy. And frankly, I'm going back to what Dr. Rappaport told me I should have done to begin with, and that was leave the tics out of it, because that involves neurology, and you'll just have 20 years of fights. She was right. <laughs> OCD plus all the other symptoms. And you have to have at least two of the seven, but as you'll see from Dr. Frankovich's data, almost all of the kids have at least five, six, or seven of these accompanying symptoms. So the syndrome of PANS is very distinctive very identifiable, and when it presents, there is a very reasonable way to go about this. The eating disorders are of two types. You get a classic anorexia nervosa where the child literally thinks they're fat or they worry about becoming fat if they get to 48 pounds and they're 45 and they're a thin, healthy little girl who uh, just stops eating, or they stop eating because they have obsessive concerns about contamination or fear of choking, fear of vomiting, guilt and scrupulosity. We've had kids who wouldn't let themselves eat because they didn't deserve to eat. And once the weight loss exceeds about 10 to 15 percent of their body weight, which again in a five-year-old only takes a four or five pound weight loss, then the body image distortion, distortions begin. These kids should have a swallowing study because, remember the girl with the Sydenham's chorea, how every time she went to do a voluntary movement, it set off involuntary? If you swallow, there is a voluntary component and an involuntary component, and they probably have a dysphagia that could be treated. The comorbid symptoms, sleep disorders in 80% of the kids, everything. And we at first thought it was the anxiety was giving them the initial insomnia. We actually think now it's a disruption of the sleep cycle. And one of my colleagues, Ashura Buckley, has just completed uh, before and after treatment sleep studies on 15 children, documenting that at baseline they have REM behavior disorder, a failure to establish atony during REM sleep. Rapid eye movement sleep is when you dream and you're supposed to be paralyzed so that you don't act out on your dreams. If your kids have this, they're sleeping in the bed with you and they are moving all night and there are times when they are particularly violent and kicking at you and flailing at you and you can't get a wink of sleep. Those children deserve a polysomnography, a sleep study. Behavioral regression, five and six-year-old children go back to crawling, playing with baby toys, sticking pacifiers in their mouth. Inability to concentrate, hyperactivity, inattentiveness, learning difficulties, and the most important and probably pathognomonic sign, if you have an acute onset of behavioral disruption, with urinary frequency or new onset of daytime accidents and wetting or new onset of, of bedwetting, that is PANS. 
that symptom isn't something people develop as a conversion disorder or uh, psychiatric sequelae. That is a hard neurologic symptom that can help us get our kids treatment that they need. Handwriting changes, let's say you're trying to make this diagnosis at three years or more, I guess is what we just heard. In those children take their school journals from th those years that they've been affected and put them against not only their medical record, but the other children in your home. Because what you'll find is when their handwriting deteriorates, either they've had a strep infection or one of their siblings has. And this is what it may very well look like. And uh, we saw last night a beautiful example also of the left margin uh, ignoring so that the children's handwriting kind of drifts over to the right side. Behavioral regression, here's a picture drawn, very messy. If my grandson, who's almost three, drew that, I would be incredibly impressed, because that's a four-year-old drawing, but it was actually done by a 10-year-old during her acute illness. And this was in uh, June, so 6, 2006, and that was 9, 2006, after a successful course of IVIG. Medical workup, physical exam for occult infections, adenoids, tonsils, sinuses, urethra, Perianal strep is a common cause of sort of treatment refractory um, pans, pandas. So it's worth doing a culture. We were just talking last night about how we might think about doing that more effectively. Look for choreiform movements and absolutely rule out chorea. If you can make a diagnosis of Sydenham chorea, there's a very well accepted easy path to follow in terms of prophylaxis, and immunomodulatory therapy is actually indicated for treatment of Sydenham. Test for strep infections, they're only detectable with an adequate swab and culture. If Tanya Murphy was giving this talk, she would tell you that the child has to have a little blood on the back of this, on the swab to indicate that they've gotten back into the uh, oropharynx junction with the nasopharynx adequately. I was taught that if you didn't uh, fear for your shoes, because the gag reflex was so strong that you thought the child was going to throw up on you, that that was an adequate culture. Whatever it is, it's not enough to just kind of tickle the back of the tongue. That's not where the strep lives. And then you have to plate it out for 48 hours. If the rapid strep is positive, great. It's a very specific test, so you know that child has strep. But many of them aren't. And particularly here in this area, we're trying to figure out if there are specific strains related. And our NIMH laboratory, excuse me, the NIH Clinical Center laboratory would be thrilled to receive those strep slabs. So just send uh, me an email or work through Diana, and we'll be able to get it done. Mm -hmm. See, the PANS network makes a difference. Lab tests, we have long discussions about the utility of strep titers. I'm just going to take the easy way out and tell you that Pat Cleary found that even if you do anti, uh, ASO, anti strep O, anti strep DNA B, and another test that you're only going to pick up two thirds of infections with those strep titers. And more importantly, only a rising titer indicates a new infection, so you have to take a titer at baseline, and again, six to eight weeks later. And the bottom line is, it's just not worth it. I hear from families all the time, we've had my child on antibiotics for two months and the strep titer actually increased. That's okay. In fact, it's expected. There's absolutely nothing about treating an infection that's going to make those titers go away because they're antibodies that were established during the acute infection and are circulating and will remain sometimes for years. Anti-nuclear antibody tests, the most nonspecific test in the world. It's a test that's thought to uh, be an early indicator of lupus and about 56 percent of our patients at the NIH are positive for that. If you find a positive ANA, it's a wonderful sign that they have something autoimmune going on. Caveat here, up to 10% of healthy, typically developing children will also have a positive ANA. And then finally, the molecular lab. I just learned last, late week, or last night that it takes six weeks to get these results. So in the early diagnosis, I'm not sure it's that helpful. But in a child who remains ill, it may be useful in helping to distinguish whether the, it's a pans, pandas, or a different problem. Swallowing study if they have problems with foods. Polysomnography, which is an overnight sleep study. While they're doing the overnight sleep study, they should uh, maximize the leads for electroencephalography as well. 
If you find out any spikes in waves or slowing, which are present in about 10% of our patients, that is uh, considered by neurologists to be a sign of autoimmune encephalopathy. This polysomnography actually provides some new treatment uh, suggestions, including high-dose benzodiazepines for the kids with the REM behavior disorder. Benzos are like Valium. They're the uh, calming drugs, and we've always stayed away from them in PANS pandas because in pediatric patients, they can uh, set off an idiosyncratic reaction where the child actually gets really wild. How many of you, uh, Benadryl does the same thing. So if your child had, goes crazy when you gave him a dose of Benadryl, that would be what might happen with a benzo only about 10 times worse. So we haven't used them, but I think if they had evidence of a REM behavior disorder, benzos are actually the treatment of choice for that. And then finally, lumbar puncture. And I think that in this case, what we really want to do is make sure that the child with PANS doesn't have one of those other dozens of possible causes of this acute behavior deterioration. So you need to rule out encephalitis, meningitis, all kinds of things, including lab assays that can be done. And I know it makes people anxious. I was in the generation of the original exorcist where they did the spinal tap and her head spun around. It doesn't happen that way. For those of us who do spinal taps, it's actually a lot easier than drawing blood. It's just a little scary because the child has to lay down flat. Eradicate the infection. Tanya Murphy has just finished a study of ceftonir. Three weeks uh, at treatment level doses had very positive results. She's working on a zithromycin study. We've all heard about the Augmentin addicts, and we're actually going to meet in May to talk about trying to possibly do a study of clavulinic acid, because the basic science literature is now showing that it has effects on dopamine and glutamate that should make it actually beneficial on its own, and you wouldn't have to make the child uh, vulnerable to that broad-spectrum antibiotic. And consider immunomodulatory therapy. I would recommend three levels of, of approach for a child who's sort of mild to moderately ill uh, the antibiotics, if those aren't having adequate effect, then move to steroids. For children who are moderately ill and can't get to school, can't get out of the house, IVIG is a reasonable approach before you give it. Do that workup that would include sleep study, EEG, LP, blood work to make sure it's not something else. And then Beth Latimer and I are going to advocate for plasmapheresis for severe life-threatening situations. And she is working with the folks at Georgetown. Uh, they have treated over 85 children with pandas successfully with plasmapheresis. We need to get that case series written up. But life-threatening to me is the child who has refused to eat, has stopped eating, and literally the weight is just disappearing. They can develop cardiac dysrhythmias, which are quite troublesome or those children who are actively suicidal and highly impulsive, or the children, obviously, who have such rage that they are a danger to themselves or others. Then you have to, have to, have to do this piece as well. And it's the full court press that you want to do everything you can to get your child better, and that includes cognitive behavior therapy and psychotropic medications. The blogs are full of reports of SSRIs making my child worse, I know of those SSRIs. They're the activating ones that kind of make them feel akathetic, and they are just revved up inside, but they already were revved up before you put them on the medicine. There are other SSRIs who don't have those side effects. Those are the ones that should be used, and you start low. When I say low, one-tenth of the normal dose that you would give a child, and then taper up slowly. The problem is, what are you going to do in the meantime? Major tranquilizers are the antipsychotics. That's why we use them, not necessarily for antipsychosis, although 20% of children with PANS, PANDAS, will have hallucinations and meet criteria for psychosis. Anxiolytics, melatonin, or a stronger sedative agent. And then after the child has recovered, not in the early stages, because it will make things worse, but later, maybe use of stimulants. And that's the end. Thank you.